Another quiet day here in uh, Durham, North Carolina. I had actually just gone outside and saw that it was a little bit on the warm side, probably about like around uh, 83 degrees or something like that. Definitely partly sunny and definitely some uh, good weather. Of course, folks are paying attention to what's going on in the world, whether that's the things that are going on at our border or whether that's the things that are going on with the uh, new government that is coming into place in Israel or whether that's things that are happening in terms of folks getting vaccinated and all of that. So a number of these things are happening in our community and in our world. And of course, we're going to find out more about what folks thoughts are about a number of these things. And who knows, we might have some folks that pop in and have their conversations as well. I know I was talking to uh, definitely uh, Brian Schulman and Tim Sohn and some other folks and has actually had the pleasure of seeing Tim Sohn and uh, Nancy have a conversation around uh, some of the uh, things that are going on in his life. And of course, we do know a lot of people are fighting various things and definitely are still giving us positive messages as they continue to do on a regular basis. So definitely um, always great to have these amazing conversations and to have folks join us on a regular basis. So looking forward to seeing who's gonna pop in on the radio show with Mark Lee on today and what kind of guests we might have and what kind of conversations and all of that. And definitely uh, glad to be here on Pod TV. glad to share the wisdom that I've got or the wisdom that I'm trying to accumulate because you know, we are always constantly learning, constantly trying to develop new ideas, new thoughts and all of that. So definitely wanna thank folks for joining us here on the network and uh, definitely I uh, know earlier today me and Shaquille and others were having conversations around a number of things, including what's going on in the Olympics and even some of the newer news about what's happening with the vaccine and along those lines. So definitely always great to have these amazing conversations and seeing how folks are doing in that regards. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I just saw was that, you know, at the uh, NATO summit, leaders are focusing on China's military ambition. So that's one of the stories that we're seeing is that President uh, Biden had his first meeting with NATO nations and he reiterated his support for uh, definitely um, the alliance and that his uh, predecessor despaired. So, you know, a lot of times uh, the person that famously was in the office was not a big fan of uh, the alliances and all of that. So definitely even broke up some of the alliances and some of the things along that line. But uh, President Biden has definitely uh, let folks know that he is definitely very supportive. But there's also some, comp some concerns about what's going on in some of the other parts of the world as well. So one of the documents that the leaders are set to approve describes Russia as a threat and China as presenting challenges. So definitely will be interesting to see how things play out in the world with that as well. So definitely that's some of the things that we're seeing going on and all of that. So we're going to find out more about how that goes and all along those lines. So well, one of the other prime ministers apparently had a shaky start at the G7 uh, conference and all of that. So, you know, he made a shaky start, start that being the person out of um the UK area and all of that. So that's one of the things that I did see that was going on. So yeah, um, the prime minister, Boris Johnson, was planning to introduce his vision of a nimble trade savvy UK, but that was upended by a spat over Northern Ireland. So, you know, we talk about what goes on in some of these countries that have had spats going on for years and everything. And it looks like Great Britain and Ireland is another one of those, just like Israel and Palestine and a number of other ones around the world. So. Uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson earlier had an unmatched setting in which to launch his dream of a global Britain. But as Mr. Johnson drew the Group of Seven meeting to a close, Brexit and the pandemic conspired to cloud its debut. Uh, so definitely one of the things that he found himself at in a news conference on Sunday was dodging questions about a four-week delay in Britain's reopening of its economy and trying to play down an ugly clash with the European the Union over Northern Ireland. The latter issue dramatizes the long shadow that Brexit is casting on Mr. Johnson's effort to rebrand Britain as a vital player on the global stage. Not only did Northern Ireland poison Mr. Johnson's talks with President Emmanuel Macron of France, but it also threatens to undermine his relationship with President Biden. So definitely uh, glad to see that these world leaders are getting together. But like any time when world leaders get together, there are sometimes things that are not quite going the way that you want them to go and all of that. So uh, 
definitely it'll be interesting to see how things go into this uh, whole G7, what kind of things that actually come out of it and all of that. You know, one of the things that is definitely being known and being talked about is the urgent need for vaccines, which was driven home by the announcement on Monday of Britain's postponed reopening caused by a spread of a variant known as Delta among the unvaccinated population. On Sunday evening, which was yesterday evening, Mr. Johnson left Cornwall as soon as he saw off his guests so he could huddle with advisors in London over the latest scientific data on infections and hospitalizations. So he was saying that when you've got a coronavirus raging around the world, one billion doses by next summer is not a deliverable worth mentioning, said Jamie Drummond, who co-founded the advocacy group One with Bono, which is the uh, lead singer of U2, as many folks in the music world know. By next summer, summer, this person is saying it's a death sentence for millions. Um, And on climate change, where Mr. Johnson had promised a Marshall Plan-like effort to curb carbon emissions, the Group of Seven failed to set a firm date to phase out coal-burning power plants, a primary contributor to global warming. The prime minister will get another chance to nail down commitments in November at the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Glasgow. Still, it's not a failure to strike global deals that apparently caused the most uh, headaches for Mr. Johnson. It was the jarring intrusion of Northern Ireland into the proceedings. So definitely looks like Northern Ireland was going to make themselves felt in the proceedings as well. So definitely that's some of the things that are going on in the world. Of course, you do know sports is happening as well. And of course, uh, we've definitely got tennis going on. We've got the hockey championships, even though the Carolina Hurricanes were eliminated several days back and all of that. And of course, we've got the NBA where um, definitely uh, Phoenix made a quick dispatch of Denver. And now they'll wait for the other winner on the Western side for those Western finals. And, of course, we still got the four teams battling it out on the east with uh, Philadelphia up 2-1 and Brooklyn and Milwaukee tied at two apiece. So it's going to be a while till we figure out a winner from the east and which of those winners will go up against each other. And we still got to figure out the other winner on the other side of the west bracket. So still got some uh, things to go before we figure out who the NBA championship is going to be and all of that. So it ought to be some interesting conversations along that line as well. So definitely looking forward to uh, hearing what more people have to say about these things and all of that. So definitely that's some of the news that is going around our world and all of that. So, um, but as a matter of fact, we've got interesting news from the Vatican. They were warning the U.S. bishops not to deny Biden communion over abortion. So conservative American Catholic bishops are present for a debate over whether Catholics who support the right to an abortion should be allowed to take communion. So the Vatican has warned conservative American bishops to hit the brakes on their push to deny communion to politicians supportive of abortion rights, including President Biden, a faithful churchgoer and the first Roman Catholic to occupy the Oval Office in 60 years. But despite the remarkably public stuff signed from Rome, the American bishops are pressing ahead anyway and are expected to vote to force a vote on the communion issue at a remote meeting that starts on Wednesday. Some leading bishops whose priorities clearly align with former President Donald Trump now want to reassert the centrality of the opposition to abortion in Catholic faith and lay down a hard line, especially with a liberal Catholic in the Oval Office. The vote threatens to shatter the facade of unity with Rome, highlight the political polarization within the American church, and set what church historians consider a dangerous precedent for bishop conferences across the globe. The concern in the Vatican said Antonio Spadara, a Jesuit priest and a close ally of Francis, is done not to use access to the Eucharist as a political weapon. I'm going to go get a little bit of water and continue this story and all of that. But in the meantime, I'm going to let you check out a little bit of a uh, very powerful uh, speech by one of our great uh, folks that do public speaking. So that's my good friend, Barbara Smith. We're going to let you check this out while I go grab a glass of water. Hi, I'm Barbara H. Smith, known as the Masterful Presenter. If you could figure out a universal language, personality code, that connects with potential client, how powerful would that be? I empower people to communicate better what they do, 
what they have and what they bring to the table. People love to buy. I don't need you to sell it to me. I'm going, I come in there with an intention and that's what you're going to do going forward. You're going to go into networking events with intention. I am here benefiting from the wisdom of Barbara Smith. She gave so much information on how I can just excel in my business and I'm taking it to a whole nother level. I'm learning a lot that I didn't really know about my business. The information that she's been presenting has been informative and helpful to me. If you have not been in the presence of Miss Holmes Smith, you need to make sure you do so. Her workshops are authentic, she comes with such training, and she just graces you with her presence and she allows you to feel the experience like none other before. <laughs> See, being in business, regardless if you're a non-to business or any type of business, it's about connecting. It's about hearing new information that can drive you forth. It's more about coming together with people with like minds in order to make your business grow. You don't wake up wanting to be mediocre and just do just enough. You want to excel. You want to be a master in your craft. You want to take it to the next level. So you, it's not going to happen by accident. So you have to be mindful and think of what can I do today to help take me to the next level. The truth is, your life will only change when you get new information. Your life will only change when you move forward with another level of thinking. This expo is about new information and moving your life to another level. Coming back to our story on the uh, Catholic Church and everything, Pope Francis, who has explicitly identified the United States as the source of opposition to his pontificate, preached this month that communion is not the reward of saints, but the bread of sinners. His top doctrinal official, Cardinal Louis Laterra, wrote a letter to the American bishops warning them that the vote could become a source of discord rather than unity within the Episcopate and the larger church in the United States. The result is a rare open rift between Rome and the American church. Opponents of the vote suspect a more naked political motivation aimed at weakening the president and a pope many of them disagree with, with a drawn out debate over a document that is sure to be amplified in the conservative Catholic media and on right wing cable news programs. Asked about the communion issue, Andrew Bates, a White House spokesman, said, as the American people know well, the president is a strong person of faith. Um, Pope Francis, along with the rest of his church's hierarchy, expressly opposes abortion, which they consider among the gravest sins, and incessantly speaks out against it. But that is not the same as punishing Catholic lawmakers with the denial of communion, which many here believe would be an intrusion into the matters of state. The effort is being led by Archbishop Jose, Jose Gomez of Los Angeles, the president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, who has been passed over repeatedly by Francis for elevation to the rank of cardinal. The focus of this proposed uh, teaching document, Archbishop Gomez wrote in a memo, is how best to help people to understand the beauty and the mystery of the Eucharist as the center of their Christian life. The conservative American bishops are largely out of step with Francis and his agenda of putting climate change, migrants, and poverty on the church's front burner. But Reverend Thomas J. Reese, a Jesuit priest and a senior analyst with Religion News Services, said conservatives constitute at least half of the American Bishops Conference and could have the votes to begin the process of drafting a teaching document about who can receive communion. So it definitely sounds like this is going to be an interesting argument that's going to go on for a while and all of that. So definitely it'll be interesting to see how this continues to play out and what impact it might even have on uh, the political landscape and all of that, because we do know that uh, these kind of things can definitely play into the uh, political landscape. And it'll be interesting to see what it does in this case as well. So all kinds of fascinating things are happening in the world and trying to keep my eyes on them, that I can pass them on to you as well. 
speaking of which, I did see some unusual news. You know, you got to be careful who you uh, make mad and all of that, because I did see a news story where somebody had uh, actually um, gone and made uh, Lorena Bobbitt seem mild, because they had actually done something similar, but then they decided to cook it, and now they are facing charges down there in Brazil, and apparently it was a young 33-year-old woman that was involved in that as well. So like I said, you got to be careful what you do, because it could cause you all kinds of troubles in that regards. So uh, another story that's been making interesting news is how, um, you know, even if you do something that was not seen as a good thing in our society, you can survive it and still do things if you get the support of those that might have been harmed. So the Virginia governor has survived a blackface scandal with the help of African-American Democrats who saw a chance for policy concessions. Both got more from the relationships than they could have imagined. So if you'll remember Alonzo Jones, a black mayor in Southern Virginia, was used to the playbook of a white politician facing allegations of racism. So when Governor Ralph Norton visited his town after a racist photograph was discovered on the governor's medical school yearbook pages, Mr. Jones expected more of the same, a requisite visit to the African-American church, a news conference with African-American allies, and the promise of growth moving forward. Even so, uh, Jones did agree to a private meeting, and uh, he even asked him, what can we do for you? And uh, the governor shot back, what can I do for you? And soon to Mr. Jones' surprise, Mr. Nordham began making the kinds of statewide changes that the mayor suggested he should do. On a national level, Mr. Nordham may forever be enshrined as the Democrat who defied calls to resign in the face of unquestionable racism. A photograph on his yearbook page that showed one man in uh, blackface and another in a KKK costume. But among black political leaders and elected officials in Virginia, he is set to leave office with another legacy, becoming the most racially progressive governor in the state's history, whose focus on uplifting black communities or African-American communities since the, since the 2019 scandal will have a tangible and lasting, a lasting effect. So his arc from being a political pariah denounced by nearly every national Democrat to a popular incumbent with support from African-American elected officials and even progressive Activist is a complex story of personal growth and political pressure, a testament how crisis can provide opportunity. And hopefully we're going to see that even with what's going on in the pandemic as well. However, this kind of thing would not have been possible without the African-American Virginians who rallied around him, even as they stared down immense pressure to help force him from office. African-American staff members who stayed in the administration a legislative black caucus that chose to focus on policy goals rather than resignation and an African-American activist community that quickly followed the lawmakers strategic lead. And the result is apparently a reshaped Virginia since 2019 and aided by a democratic sweep of both state legislative offices. The Commonwealth has become the first state in the South to abolish the death penalty, allocated more than 300 million to the state's financially struggling African-American colleges, passed sweeping police reform measures and created the country's first state cabinet level position for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mr. Jones, the mayor of Danville, Virginia, said the developments were a powerful antidote to a society struggling with concepts like cancel culture and wokeness. Instead of derision, Mr. Northam and the African-American leaders who supported him showed the power of redemption, humility, and growth. So you know, sometimes that's what you have to do is you've got to... Uh, do a lot of these things in terms to show the growth and all of that. By the way, Norton, who had agreed to an, uh, Norton had uh, actually blatantly, bluntly admitted that the 2019 scandal changed the political priorities of his administration. He also said that it sent him on an ongoing personal journey of re-educating himself about race, racism, and whiteness. Uh, he said, I made it very clear from when this happened that racial equity was going to be a top priority but for the uh, remainder of our administration, he cited the elimination of the death penalty as an example. So definitely even he had to come to terms with some of his own history and all of that. Um, and definitely you know, folks that are going this, sometimes they have to come to their own terms and, and use these terms in order to make a better society and make it a better world. So I'm at least glad to see that that's one of the things that he's done. It does seem that he's definitely done some really progressive things in that. And he also was saying that, uh, well, 
Part of what's going on is also the newfound interest in history extends to Virginia's intense debate over Confederate statues, which is now forever linked to the deadly violence in Charlottesville in 2017. Since 2019, Nordham has removed several Confederate references and statues from the state parks, replaced the state holiday honoring Confederate generals with one intended to increase voting access and added more than 25 historical markers for Black history in Virginia. The answer to how exactly Mr. Nordham survived the scandal is complicated, but there is no question he survived. Uh, Biden did an event with him last month at a recent campaign event for former Governor Terry McClough, who is seeking to succeed Mr. Nordham. A speaker hailed Mr. Nordham as an African-American community figure. So definitely sometimes even after you do big things or wrong things, you can also go back there and find ways to uh, correct these things as well. So there was a um, definitely he said that he's a change man and he understands that arenas like healthcare education, business, and voting rights are all just full of racism and oppression. So, uh, And then one of the gentlemen that was involved said, uh, and his name is uh, Mr. Bellamy, says that African-American political, political leaders saw another lesson. A white person used their privilege to stay in office, but to make change, black people use their power. So, you know, like I said, a lot of times uh, folks have to learn these harsh lessons and they learn them in different ways and all of that. So that's just some of the things that are going on in our world. Um, and definitely somebody was telling me to thank me for keeping in the formed and uh, current. So definitely glad to do that. And if uh, Curtis wants to come in and share a little bit of conversation with us, we are always glad to do that as well. So always an open invitation for folks to pop in and join the conversations. And I do try to stay informed and confirmed and uh, definitely try to stay enlightened about what's going on in the world as well. So definitely glad that uh, Mr. Uh, Curtis was over there watching on the LinkedIn and was definitely uh, sharing a little bit about what he had learned um, as well. So maybe he'll come in and share about that. By the way, I just learned earlier today as I was going through my emails that one of our locals was a Pulitzer Prize judge for um, the music category and uh, that being our own John Brown. And he did a, a great job. He talked about some of the folks that he had uh, helped to select and all of that and was definitely encouraging people to do the same as well. So definitely it was amazing seeing that happen and everything. So <clears throat> definitely. Uh, Looking forward to uh, seeing things and uh, definitely having the, those conversations going on as well. So definitely uh, amazing conversations. And let me see if I can find what John said about what he had going on in his life, because we do like to stay informed, even about what some of our local folks are doing as well. And John had written this over the weekend and all of that. So if I can find out what John said about being a judge. So yes, uh, John said that he had the pleasure of serving on the jury twice before, that being the Pulitzer Prize jury. And this time he was honored to chair the 2021 Pulitzer Prize uh, music jury. And he wrote with exciting news that uh, Tanya Leon won the prize for her outstanding composition, Stride. And he definitely felt the honor was well-deserved. And the other finalists were Ted Hearn for Place and Maria Schneider for Data Lords. The official uh, link and uh, stuff can definitely uh, be found if you go to PulitzerPrize.org backslash winners. And then uh, I think there'll probably another backslash that'll have the names and all of that. But if you just go to PulitzerPrize.org backslash winners, you should be able to get it from that point and all of that. So uh, definitely wanted to thank the winners. Want to thank John, who is the vice provost for the arts and the director of the jazz program and professor of the practice of music over there at Duke University <clears throat> for his role in this uh, great event and all of that. So I know that um, I might try to get him to jump on and share a little bit about what he's got going in that regards in the, the not too distant future. So definitely always great to have some amazing conversations with folks as uh, they continue to be educated and educating us as well. So definitely that's uh, some of the things going on. And definitely glad to have so many people <coughs> here checking out what we've got going on and all of that. And, of course, there are other amazing shows on the network. And, of course, there are other amazing things happening on a regular basis as well. So definitely uh, glad to show my wisdom, share others' wisdoms, and have the folks get involved. We're going to take a, play, a break. 
bring you a couple of spots about some important places and then come back with some more news as well. I love to introduce somebody really awesome. He is a master of training other speaker and <laughs> he is a great speaker because I saw him speaking and uh, he had a call. He looks like a like athlete. He looks like a fighter. But when he starts speaking, he speaks with a really warm heart and really touch people's heart and really fascinate people. Here's to the crazy one, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and square holes. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them or disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, but the one thing you cannot do is ignore them. Because they change things, they push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones that do. Reuben West communicates by connecting with his audience when he presents and when he's sharing a key message. Being able to connect and communicate your instructions clearly is a masterful skill. The ultimate professional. Reuben is a guy that not only teaches a message but also demonstrates the message. He's helped me to craft my art and I'm sure he'll help you to craft yours. Very accomplished international speaker being able to just connect to any audience no matter where they come from or what kind of people they are. He helps you and serves you in every kind of way to elevate you as a speaker and I highly recommend him. He is a people's heart connecting scientist with a using instrument of your voice and your appearance and your heart to touch people's heart. His communication is unmatched. I'm Australian, he's American, and it really makes no difference as to our culture and where we have come from because his message, the way he communicates it, is from humanity. Find a way to take the next step. Thank you. It is a gym, tucked away near a forest, a place where the lost are found. It is a gift of wholeness for those who are ready to receive it. A secret place where peace can be found in stillness. Where you can finally stop fighting to survive and just breathe. Just Breathe. Where accountability corrects and the word help is not a cuss word. It is the place that was thought of before you ever thought you needed it. It is where forgiveness starts and healing begins. Well, we are taught that when we put our hands to work, we can create something. As we uprooted the weeds in the garden, it was a reflection of our lives. As we uprooted disappointment, as we uprooted pain, as we uprooted being traumatized. Because God doesn't deal with the surface. He gets to the root of it. We laugh. We shared tears, we shared our stories, we shared our fears, our dreams, our visions, our heart. We were more than just mothers. We were broken women trying to figure out how to become whole again. It became a place where homelessness became hopeless until we reached the bridge 
of wholeness. All right, so that was some important things that were said right there. And of course, we still got more uh, interesting information that we want to share with you as well. So definitely uh, have a number of things going on. And of course, there was the powerful expo that was going on earlier, the Black Business Expo and all of that. So a number of things have been happening. And of course, we're trying to keep you informed as much as possible to find out what you've got going on and things along those lines. By the way, if you've got comments like uh, that other gentleman did, you can definitely leave them on the uh, comment board. And of course, we love hearing from our folks and hear what they've got going on in their world as well. So definitely anybody that's interested can definitely jump on board and check out what we've got happening all of this. And uh, definitely we'll uh, see how things are going in that regard. So looking forward to seeing some great conversations and all of that. So. Uh, Looking forward to seeing what happens and what goes on in that regard. So uh, definitely uh, if folks are interested in joining the comments, then they can just jump on the links and make the comments as well. So looking forward to seeing some amazing conversations. I know that I've talked to a couple of folks and they are definitely saying that they're going to jump on and share their wisdom and their knowledge and all of that. So if folks are watching and are interested, then definitely they can uh, get a chance and check out our conversation. And if they're interested in joining the links, uh, of course, we're always interested in having guests join us on a regular basis and love having those kind of conversations with them. So if folks are interested in joining, they can uh, definitely jump on the link and share their wisdom because we love having conversations with our guests and all of that. So if you're interested in joining, I'll put it in the chat and you can come into the studio uh, and join the conversations that we have on the radio show. So definitely keep that in mind that you can join in this conversation if you're interested in popping in and joining with the conversation uh, as we talk on a regular basis about a number of things going on in the world and of course try to share our positivity in the world as well. So uh, definitely keep that in mind. And as we talk about a number of things that are of a concern to the world, we would love to hear from you as well. So definitely keep that in mind. And of course, we love hearing from our friends and cohorts and who knows, some of them may decide that they want to uh, join the conversation. And if so, that is how they can do it. So look forward to hearing from my uh, various LinkedIn friends and seeing what they want to do and what kind of conversations that they would like to be joining in as well. So I do see that Frank Hill has been joining in the conversation and a number of others have as well. So definitely if folks are interested in popping in and sharing what's going on in their world, we would love to have those conversations because that's part of what the radio show is all about. So definitely if you're on LinkedIn and you're interested in popping in, then we would love to hear from you and seeing what kind of conversations that you would like to have as well. So definitely do keep that in mind and of course uh we love to hear from folks that are going on and having these amazing conversations here on the network and all of that but right now i'm going to bring you to the attention of some other events that were going on in the world and definitely some other amazing things that have been happening in the community and all of that so that being said i'm going to bring up some very powerful uh things that have happened including some other folks that have been doing some amazing work and all of that, including my friend Bruce George, who has been doing some things around the Genius is Common movement. So I'm going to let you check out some of their announcements while I wait to see if other folks want to join. But before we get to that, I'm going to let you check out one of my friends who has got his marketing company and does some great marketing. So let's see what Jerry is talking about as well.
I am Sharon Lee, and my genius is video. I am first a woman of God that loves to laugh and make others feel good about themselves. I am the founder, creator, and owner of Video Mania Marketing Production Agency, a creative and visionary leader. I am also the master videographer ambassador to the Genius is Common movement. And I want to thank God and Mr. Bruce George for this amazing opportunity and platform. Now, there are many videographers in this world. So what makes me different, you may ask? It's my passion for video, mobile marketing, and cutting-edge technology. I was always called the Mrs. Gadget to Mr. Gadget back in the day. My passion will always keep my clients in front of their competitors and I strive to keep my clients excited and see them succeed. The fact that no one does video like I do, and I don't do video like anyone else, that is my genius, and I own it. From 3D life-size lip sync avatars, live footage action logos, live footage and photo cinemagraphs, also known as GIFs, to sketch to photo or sketch to video explainer videos and live event recordings and so much more. Your videos are on steroids. Video email marketing is here. I show you how to leverage video with email, video newsletters, even video signup forms and autoresponders. You don't have a list? No problem. I can help you with that too. I work with clients who want their message told in a unique way that grabs attention, keeps interest, and compels to take action. We work together not on just a video, but a video marketing strategy. Video is here. So don't leave your money on the table. Don't be the one left behind. You have a genius in you too. Your genius is that special something that you do that no one else can ever take away from you. Whatever it may be, no one can do it like you do. Your special touch and your special way makes you a genius in who you are. Everyone has a genius in them. Don't let the world put you in a box or classify you. Own your genius. Join the movement and let me help you announce your genius to the world. Because genius is common. Vowero Otomewo Oriaki, popularly known as Dr. V or Lady V. I'm a best selling author, a confidence coach, a motivational speaker, and a next level strategist. The genius in me is the Godfidence in me. Always remember, genius is common. Makeup by Holly Beauty Partners is a collective of hairstylists, makeup artists, and fashion stylists who bring beauty services to the masses 
So we are not just licensed hairstylists, certified makeup artists, but we are also beauty consultants. So we want to make sure that we are always connecting our target audience look that resonates with their target audience. The secret sauce with Makeup by Holly Beauty Partners is we are not just a collective of beauty professionals, we're also beauty consultants. So as we're meeting with our clients, we're educating them on their skincare needs, their holistic beauty needs, so that we can help to make sure that they are always armed with education and training that can serve them no matter where they travel. We are now partnering with the brand Preneur and we're so excited to be able to do so. So as he's meeting with his clients, we want to make sure that their look can resonate with their target audience. Three words to describe our brand are luxurious, beautiful, and professional. I am Holly Bird Miller and I am a brand for newer. Then you have to believe on it. Then you have to believe in it so hard because people put their issues and their insecurities on you. Scott made the beat. My name is Scott Galley, and I'm the CEO of Haystack Industries, and I am a genius. Hey y'all, it's TSU The Buzz Radio with your host, I am Zaire, also known as DJ Roz. And I am genius. Our job is to find that genius level talent and then to apply it in a way that supports that genius level talent. My name is Gabriel Golden. I'm a student at Tennessee State University, and everyone has a genius in them. So I challenge you to find your genius. I'm Jaha, Chief of Tonkawa of Texas, artist and entrepreneur. My genius is master building. Master building with what's in my hands or nothing at all. I learned to keep it simple, clear, and concise. Lay a strong foundation in truth and purity, and you really can't go wrong. Allow room for yourself and others to grow. Tap deep. I learned a lot there. Like, it's better to steer away from being judgmental. Um, I learned more about my uniqueness. I learned about authenticity, so on and so on and on and on and on. I realized I didn't have to spend my time being in competition because I already won. You don't have to spend your time always competing against me. You're already a winner. Allow yourself room to grow and allow others room to grow. To learn yourself, to learn what your genius is and to be the best you, to be the best genius that you are. This is our individual journey as well as our collective journey. And it's not so much that we have to explain ourselves to people to help them to get us, because they're probably not going to get us anyway. <laughs> you know, um, you'll know when you struck that genius goal, because you'll freely share, and you'll share it with great love and wisdom, whatever you want. Know it, be it, and do it. 
Don't be afraid to live it out. Be the inspiration. Be the miracle. Be the dream. Be the love. Be the success. So, what's your genius? Own it. Go fearlessly. We are innately wired with genius. Pay it forward with good intentions. Genius is common. I am 11 years old, and my genius is entrepreneurship, and my genius is comedy. I have been hard at work, and my genius since the age of eight when I asked my parents to buy me an ice cream cart for my eighth birthday. Why? Because I love ice cream and I knew that 99.9% .9 of the world loves ice cream too. I started my business because I want to make my own money, give to my school's missionary, help my family, and buy my own toys. While working in my genius, I have learned a lot about business and what it takes to be successful. I quickly learned that hard work, determination, and perseverance are the standard qualities you need to succeed. However, in my four years as a business owner, I have learned things that you can't learn from a book like the true meaning of customer service. Great customer service is how you sincerely say thank you to each person who spends their money with you. I have learned that there are more people praying for me to succeed than those who are not. I have learned that people are always watching and are expecting great things from me. I can't imagine letting them down. I have learned that I must lift as I rise and that I must be my brother's keeper. I have learned that it is very important to give back to the people, the colleges, and the community where I live. I have also learned that once I become a billionaire, I will be well on my way to becoming a billionaire and to changing the world by providing jobs and opportunities to others.
All right, folks, back with some more interesting news and everything. And of course, there's all kinds of interesting news stories that we want to share with you and everything. One of them being that the FBI uh, yeah, is advancing technology recently, uh, which allowed it to score two big wins. He just intercepted most of the colonial pipeline Bitcoin ransom extorted, extorted by hackers, and they exported a messaging app as part of an international sting operation. But experts, including law enforcement, tech specialists, and prosecutors, tell the New York Times that the breakthrough are dropped in the bucket and can encourage criminals go, to go even further underground. Law enforcement agencies are investing in data extraction tools and having an easier time accessing data from the cloud. Still, they say tech companies and lawmakers can do more to help. Volkswagen and Audi, VW's luxury brands, have announced a data breach that affects 3 million U.S. and Canadian customers. Contact information was compromised, and in some cases, vehicle identification numbers, driver's license numbers, and the social security numbers were stolen. You know, we definitely got to be safe in these days and times to try to make sure that our numbers are safe and protected and that they don't get into the wrong hands and all of that because we do know that hackers are out there doing constant hacking and negative things in that realm. And by the way, it looks like uh, Facebook has got a competitor that may be gaining ground. So that's always interesting when we see folks that are gaining ground in that space. And I'm actually part of this uh, particular page as well. And it does have some advantages, but social network next door has gained ground on its rivals over the course of the pandemic rights axis with one in three U U.S. households now on the platform. The app connects users on a hyper local level, allowing them to share information about neighborhood services, missing or lost pets and other community concerns. Unlike similar sites, it requires users to use their real names and addresses. But despite these safeguards, the platform hasn't been able to completely avoid contentious national debate and controversy. But like I said, definitely I've been on that site and definitely you've seen all kinds of conversations. I think I've even seen conversations about pets, definitely conversations around some of our local politics, including wondering about things dealing with our uh, school board and uh, I believe the county commissioners and a number of other things as well. And definitely some interesting sightings of like uh, definitely at different animals and other things that have been on that website. So yeah, definitely I'm a fan of Nextdoor as well. So definitely on Facebook, but also on Nextdoor and always interesting conversations when that happens. So definitely glad to see that that was going on and glad to see that more people were checking that out. By the way, Novavax announced Monday its two-dose COVID-19 vaccine has been shown safe and is 90.4% effective against symptomatic infections in a phase three clinical trial. And I've learned that some of that work has actually been done here in the triangle. The biotech firm plans to file for authorization with the FDA in the third quarter of this year. If authorized, it will join three other COVID vaccines, Pfizer BioNTech, Moderna, and J&J &J, already approved for emergency use in the U.S. A federal judge in Texas dismissed a lawsuit brought by hospital workers in Houston who claimed the mandate to be vaccinated against COVID-19 was unlawful. The FDA also told Johnson & Johnson to discard about 60 million COVID-19 shots produced at a Baltimore factory over contamination concerns, according to an anonymous source. And while the number of vaccinated Americans remains high, the rate has slowed, with close to one-third of the Americans still hesitant about getting the shot according to the New York Times. So we do have a lot of folks who are still hesitant about getting the shot, still concerned about what kind of impact it could have on them and all of that. So definitely, but it does seem like things are slowing down and that is a good thing as we start getting maybe closer to herd immunity or at least maybe the pandemic just waning down. So uh, predictions of a great resignation appear to be coming to pass with the share of workers leaving jobs at 2.7% in April, the highest level in more than 20 years, according to the Wall Street Journal, citing U.S. Labor Department data. The elevated quit rate is a stark contrast to a year ago when workers were focused on job security during the pandemic. Economists say employee churn is a sign of a healthy labor market and higher worker confidence as people leave for better prospects, even during a still shaky economic recovery. And it looks like a COVID 
alien NFT has sold for a pretty ridiculous amount, 11.75 million and all of that. So it'll be interesting to see what this guy say. A billionaire buyer has snapped up a rare crypto punk NFT called COVID alien for 11.75 million. According to CNBC, make it, it's one of the nine blue skinned alien punks and one of 175 wearing a mask. Sotheby says Thursday sales set a new world auction record for a single crypto punk. According to Barron's, there are some 10,000 crypto punks, which are pixelated characters created by two software developers in 2017 and minted on the Ethereum blockchain. So definitely, you know, folks are going out there and getting all kinds of interesting things. And I can probably think of a lot of things that millionaires and others could do with that kind of money versus getting a uh, digital painting and all of that. But who am I? I don't have that kind of money. So maybe I shouldn't be the one to complain. But definitely, I can think of a lot of things, even in terms of helping society, that folks could do if they had that kind of money. But, you know, I'm not the one with the cash. And if they want to do that, how can I argue with them? While many employees are mulling career changes as the economy reopens, younger ones are raring to return to the office. Almost 60% of white collar staff aged 21 to 30 said that working in a modern collegiate office environment has become more important to them over the past year. According to Bloomberg, which cited a sharp uh, corporation survey, believe in uh, WFHA has in some way hobbled their career. So the majority favor at least a hybrid work model post pandemic, according to a separate Citric poll. So definitely I know a lot of folks that are hoping for that hybrid version of work and all of that, not hoping to have to be <coughs> in the workforce in its traditional form and all of that. So it'll be interesting to see how things continue to play out on the uh, world economy and all of that. So, uh, their parents to even be a great divide um, with return to office, according to an article that I'm seeing. But as well, Goldman Sachs employees flooded back into their Manhattan office after being called back on uh, Monday, just a short distance away. City Corps headquarters remain bare. City Corps said it won't recall more of its staff until July, offering employees alternate options like hybrid schedules. Meanwhile, JP Morgan and uh, Morgan Chase and Company has moved quickly to refill its office, but Bank of America isn't expecting a broad return of staff until the fall. With no two Wall Street firms taking the same approach, the city's economic optimism is being met with anxieties inside the workplace, including losing remote worker flexibility. As companies draft return to office plans, a growing number of employees are putting pressure on workers to get vaccinated, asking them to prove vaccination status. Staff returning to work may no longer have assigned workplace, the workspaces, but rather hot desk arrangements, which require making reservations. <clears throat> so you might have to uh, do that whole working from uh, home part as well, and may even have to make a reservation for the part of the uh, office space that you want and all of that. So that could be another new paradigm as well. And by the way, Twitter says that its employees can work from home forever. Well, uh, definitely J.P. Morgan and Chase is mandating that workers return to the office in the companies in the coming months. So looks like that's some of the things that are going on with the return to office and all of that. But, you know, I'm not sure there's not going to be a second ball to drop at some point or another. So that's one of the things that I am always concerned about is when does the other shoe drop to use that expression and all of that. A little bit we'll be talking about uh Thanks so space ride, but right now let's talk about private colleges, which are facing a financial crisis. The remote learning revolution spawned by the pandemic is amplifying financial pressures confronting smaller private colleges, particularly liberal arts schools, with more students opting for remote learning over pricey on-campus accommodations, crucial room and board revenue that vanished for many schools. This is documenting a looming economic crunch that's been years in the making. The kind of birth rates have led to something enrollment numbers in recent years. Axios reports that meaning that many schools <clears throat> uh, rely mostly on tuition and lack endowments to lean on are likely to be fighting for their existence in the coming years. So definitely it is having an impact on the smaller schools in that regard. Now, in terms of uh, the space ride that Beto says he wants to do, well, a mystery bidder has agreed to pay $28 million 
to a brand in the space with Amazon mogul Jeff Bezos. Some 7,600 people from 159 countries are said to have registered for the opportunity and were able to bid. CNN <clears throat> notes that Bezos' Blue Origin has been testing New Shepard, the rocket set to take him, his brother, and the un and the unnamed bidder into space for about a decade. The 15 its 15th uncrewed test flight went off without a hitch in April, and the 11-minute suborbital flight is scheduled for takeoff on July 20th. So that'll be sometime <coughs> next month that that will go into flight. But it does look, look like Jeff Bezos, along with his uh, brother and possibly some unnamed bidder, are looking to go into space and apparently stay there for some number of years. So who knows? Maybe he's thinking when he comes back down, he would have uh, figured out the uh, secret to life or maybe even the fountain of youth. But I'm trying to figure out why anybody would even want to go live up in space unless they know something that I don't know. And that is all quite possible and all of that. But I am curious to see what folks' thoughts are in that regards and whether they're going to go and do something along those lines. But, uh, you know, folks have different reasons for the things that they do. And I would be interested in finding out folks' thoughts about going up into space with the Bezos, not just going up into space, but going into space with Jeff Bezos. So that's one of the things I'd be curious to find out what folks' thoughts are in that regard. Don't forget that at four o'clock, we've got Mullins Music and Memories. And of course, at seven, we've got um, Straight Talk with Dean and Mark. And by the way, we're going to do it this Monday. We did it last Monday. We will take a break next Monday because Dean has got an anniversary coming up. And I'm not going to be the one getting in the way of anniversary love and all of that. So y'all might think that I'm wrong, but I think that I'm going to stay out of that kind of trouble if I can help it. So we're going to take another little brief break. And then when I come back, I might give you all a little dose of one of the interviews that I had the pleasure of doing last week. So I look forward to y'all checking this out. And it was an interview that featured um, definitely some great conversation around immigration. So y'all may be interested in that. So I'm going to bring that up very shortly as well. And of course, that'll take us up to about the four o'clock hour when we do Mullins and all of that. But right now we're going to take a break. And then I'll bring you this interview that we did with Tamika Watson about immigration. Hello, my name is Kiasi Hum and I'm 14 years old. I think my dreams would probably have to be setting goals and achieving them. I say this because ever since I was young, I always wanted to be an author. And at age 11, I ended up achieving this. But not only did I end up becoming an author, I ended up becoming a public speaker, a publisher, a business owner, all these great things. The name of my business is Written by Kids Publishing Company. I decided to start this company because I thought it was important for me to help kids my age express themselves through literacy and just achieve their own goals. Because to me, achieving goals is the best thing in the world to feel. It's you just achieving things and aspirations that you set for yourself. And I know that everybody is capable of this because even if you don't end up achieving the goal, you still tried your best, and that's the most important thing. And everybody is capable of this because genius is comedy. Thank you. So when I heard about the whole concept of genius is comedy, it was something I had to be a part of just simply because it was a way to it's a way to articulate what I already do uh, with the young people, right? Giving them the power to understand um, that their voice has power, that they that their truth matters. They matter. We all have gifts, and. My genius is helping others to explore and unlock those gifts. Uh, I think my greatest, my greatest genius is being a dad, though. But with this right here, we're going to take you on a little journey into John Paul's world. This is my genius, and my genius is comedy. Word. Of your 490 degree angles, solitude in the land of complete strangers. Adapting to the world changes Through my art, pour out my heart to some of the pain staying in Of your 490 degree angles Solitude in the land of complete strangers 
adapting to the world changes through my art pour out my heart to some the pain staying in right this is real this is the just the presentation of this means so much more. Just the presentation of this is letting the world know, letting your parents and all these other individuals know that you are not that, right? Because you are not, brother. You wrote that, right? Intelligence, that's what that is. You are the smartest. That's what you're going to say because that's going to be your truth. So let's start from the top, but I need you to speak louder. And I will make sure you, you're clear. I know you're reading it, so it's cool. Start from the top. Confidence. Word? Word. Count it off. Five, six, seven, eight. If you should see a man walking down the crowd the street, talk out loud to myself. Don't run in the house direction. Run towards him. For he is a boy. You have nothing to fear from the boy. But the truth, the truth. That's not so perfect. I come from a place that's big, that's small. I come from a place where people play and fight. I come from a small town where people sell narcotics, kill each other, and be greedy. My mama loved me too much to be on the streets. People rather sit on their behinds and complain, want to take but don't want to love. To love. To love. To love. To love. My genius. My genius is new man. <laughs> election time, but you'd be hard pressed to find another city as raw as mine. This is the place where MLK got locked up that one time, where I spent most of my time getting powered up to shine, cause round here, I'm something like a super saiyan. Sometimes I be talking crazy, and y'all don't understand what I be saying. On every corner, somebody praying, see, it's a lot of churches, that's why they call it the Bible Belt. When I was little, I found out how twisted switches felt. It snows sometimes, but it always melt, cause we stay hot down here in what? Say this right here is grown man music. This right here is grown man Come on. music. I say this right here is grown man music. This right here is grown man music. I say this right here is grown man music. This right here is grown man music. We're telling this right here is grown man music. This right here, this, this right here. Now I came out the trap to put the ham on the mouth. One hand on the mic. Keep One hand on the trap. Y'all be acting crazy down here in the dirty Grown man status ever since I turned 30 Frank Floor, Bill Gates, so label me nerdy Five mics in the hood, so label me worthy Man, I'm so real, I don't need no grill It is what it is, this is how I live Cause this is real life Y'all dogs that don't bite Walking in the dark, now I'm searching for the light Say hum, bruh, say hum, bruh Hum, bruh, spitting the truth Now what you spitting for? Yeah. Say go and get your own, what you waiting for? Uh -huh. Just use your head for what he made it for It's a grown man thing, holla later bro uh -huh. Say this, this right here is grown man music This right here, this right here I say this right here is grown man music This right here, this right here Jeans
Genius is common. I'm Alan J. Bryson and my genius is motivation. One thing I want to share with you is a story about the pressure to be where you want to be, whether it's peer pressure or just the pressure to have what you want. When I was young, I didn't know how to swim. So we would go to the local high school and learn how to swim and have swimming lessons. Now, to the way that they would help you learn how to swim is they would just pick you up and throw you in the water. And if you could swim, then you were fine. If you couldn't, then they would save you and say, look, until you learn how to swim, you stay in the shallow end. So as a youngster, I had to stay in the shallow end until I learned how to swim. But my big brother and all of his friends who I really wanted to hang with were hanging out in the deep end of the pool. They knew how to swim. They were comfortable, having a lot of fun. And they were, quote unquote, the cool kids. I wanted to be with the cool kids. So what did I do? That pressure to be where I wanted to be forced me to do whatever it is I had to do to work to get to that deep end of the pool. One day, I went down to the end and told the lifeguard, I'm ready to swim in the deep end. He said, are you sure? I said, I'm sure. He picked me up. He threw me in the water. And I swam with all my heart down to the shallow end. I got out. I said, do it one more time. He picked me up, threw me in the water, and I swam down to the shallow end. He said, okay, now that you've proven yourself, you can stay in the deep end of the water with the big boys and with your brother and who you deem are the cool people that you want to hang out with. That was a position and a place where I wanted to be. So what I'm saying to you is in your life, there's going to be a position that you want to be in, whether it's to be um, wherever you want to be in school or be wherever you want to be in your career. And there's going to be a sense of pressure to be where you want to be. Use that as motivation to get where you need to be. So if you are in the shallow end of the pool of life, it's time to start working as hard as you can to develop your swim skills so you can make it to the deep end of the pool. If the deep end of the pool is where you want to be, now is the time to start working on your stroke and working on your breathing and doing everything you can to make sure that you get to the deep end of the pool because that's where you want to be. Don't look at the people at the deep end of life and say, well, I'm hating on them because they have what I don't. You don't talk about them. You talk to them and say, hey, how did you get to the deep end of the pool? How did you learn how to swim that fast? So in my circumstance, the pressure of wanting to be down at the deep end of the pool was so great. I worked my behind off and did whatever I could to make sure that the next time I was thrown into the pool, I could prove my swim proficiency to make sure that they knew that I could swim and I could be in that spot where I wanted to be. The same thing happens with your life. If there's a deep end or a goal that you want, now is the time to start working on that. Don't look at where people are in the position that you want to be in and talk about them. Find out what they did. Find out how do you go about strengthening who you are and what you are to get to the deep end of pool of that pool or the deep end of where you want to be and your goals in life. I'm Alan J. Bryson. Genius is common. Hi, busy women leaders. I'm talking to you. Are you juggling your family, your business, your career, and your health? Afraid that if just one ball drops to the ground, everything could fall apart because everybody's looking at you. You're stressed and overwhelmed. You're looking for answers, for help that's real help, for solutions. I have Fiber Life Solutions that can help you. I am Hillary Goodman. The Fiber Life Coach, author, speaker, lymphologist, and pastor. I empower busy women leaders with strategies to reduce stress and anxiety while increasing energy, clarity of mind, better sleep, better health, and vitality. Oh yeah, and boost your immunity. If you are ready for that, you say, you know, I need that in my life right now. Let's connect. You can reach me at www.hillarygooden.com You can direct message me on Facebook or LinkedIn at Hillary Gooden or else if you would like to get on a free 20 minute strategy call a clarity call go to bit.ly forward slash Hillary Gooden that's bit.ly forward slash Hillary Gooden I absolutely believe you got the power to help your body help you live a more vibrant life.
So as I was saying, I'm going to bring you a uh, little bit of the interview with the uh, immigration attorney. So we're going to bring that up right now, and hopefully y'all will enjoy this on the radio show with Mark Lee. And then, like I said, later on this afternoon, we've got Mullins, and of course, we've also got our show that will be featuring uh, different uh, folks on the uh, Straight Talk with Dean and Mark, which will be coming on the audio channel. Um, that'll be on Blog Talk Radio. Of course, it'll also be on Spreaker, TuneIn, and a number of places as well. But right now, we're going to let you check out the discussion that we had with the immigration person. And I think that y'all will definitely thoroughly enjoy this one that aired on another one of our shows. But I did want to share it with my community here at the radio show as well, since it was a powerful interview done with Miss Watson, an immigration attorney. Get ready to join into a great conversation right now. It should be a fun conversation. I've got Miss Watson who popped in earlier and had a great conversation about immigration, and we were looking for her earlier, and she's come back, and I know she's going to have some great uh, thoughts on immigration as well as a lot of other things that are going on, including what I think is a little bit of a too hard line stance, but I'm curious to see what Miss Watson has to say about this as well. So I'm going to bring Miss Watson into the conversation and we're just going to join and have some great fun and all of that. So how are you doing, Miss Watson? How are you doing? I know that you're an immigration attorney and I was glad that you were able to appear last time. And if you can just share a little bit about your own background, because I'm not even sure how you got involved in immigration law, even though I can definitely tell that you've got some um, ethnicity of your own and everything. So it might have been something that was a family issue or something that you were interested in from a family standpoint. But just tell us a little bit about yourself. And then I do have some questions about what's going on now. Like I know that um, definitely seems like uh, Vice President Kamala Harris went down to Guatemala and had a very hard line stance. And in my mind, I was thinking it was a little bit too hard line, but I don't know whether you agree with me or not, but definitely we'll find out or not. But I just wanted you could share a little bit about your own background. Yeah, well, Mark, thank you so much for having me. I'm so grateful and honored to be here with you. Um, so my background, first of all, um, you can see me. So I'm, I am a South Asian. My parents are from Bangladesh. I grew up in London. I was born and raised in London. So if you've tuned into my accent, um, I am a British American. I moved to America in 2005 after I got married to my husband, uh, a U.S. citizen. And then I went through the immigration process uh, to become a U.S. citizen eventually. But I was a, a lawyer in the U.K. And when I moved to America, I had to uh, become a lawyer again by taking exams and what have you. And then I fell into immigration, uh, not by choice, but because I didn't have a lot of options at the time, or at least it felt so. But what was interesting is um, immigration was my calling, and it kept following me until I said, okay, I'll just do this. And once I started practicing immigration law, I just realized I was meant to do this all my life. I love the practice of immigration law. I'm touching people's lives uh, very directly. It's either their livelihoods or their loved ones. And the area of law is very challenging and interesting. It's always keeping me on my toes. Uh, never a dull day, as they say. And, you know, every morning I wake up and I wonder what the day holds for me. And, you know, uh, the last four years went, uh, you know, was in were interesting. And 2021 continues to be interesting. And um, my clients are amazing. I am so grateful and honored to help each and every one of them. Um, and then I, I like to be part of the change that I want to see. So I help, uh, you know, work on immigration policy issues, uh, you know, in my non spare time. Mm -hmm. And I love helping my community because Immigration is something that affects the community in a very direct way as well. And so my ex expertise and my community involvement, all of that comes together in really giving back to those who need the help. Yeah, definitely. And like I was saying earlier, I know that this has definitely been a very important issue. We've seen things going on, like I mentioned to you before, with the Dreamers. And I know that definitely my uh, dad and even his lady friend have been involved in trying to help some of those here in uh, North Carolina. And definitely we have seen even uh, some of the different uh, ways that the different immigrant communities aren't always treated the same. 
because I've even had people say that sometimes they feel that those that are European immigrants might be treated differently than say the Asian immigrants might also be treated differently than some from the African communities and all of that. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your thoughts on the ways that we treat our immigrants because I've always thought, you know, the very tailored version of what we hear is, you know, give us your poor, your, uh, and all of that is on the, um, Statue of Liberty that's over there off of New York, but I don't know that we always do what is the, said on that um, great iconic image and everything, but I was just wondering if you could share your thoughts about maybe the different ways we treat our immigrants and also your thoughts about how we're doing in Latin America. Because like I said, I know that uh, Vice President uh, Kamala is over there dealing with a lot of things and didn't have that hardline stance with Guatemala and basically saying, y'all stay over there, don't come over here. You know, um Let's touch on that before I talk about immigration as a whole. Right. I think the problem that we're seeing at the border, um, you know, it's gone on for many years. It's not a new thing at all. But what is new is that we have leadership that's trying to get to the root of the problem rather than just stick to what they need to do now. So what I appreciate about this is that uh, if you can try to address the root cause, then we might have a sustainable solution. What we have seen through previous administrations, that these issues come up and the, the focus is how do we just uh, have a system at the border? And in President Obama's years, there were there was controversy.
as well. So I'm going to bring Ms. Watson into the conversation, and we're just going to join and have some great fun and all of that. So how are you doing, Ms. Watson? How are you doing? I know that you're an immigration attorney, and I was glad that you were able to appear last time. And if you can just share a little bit about your own background, because I'm not even sure how you got involved in immigration law, even though I can definitely tell that you've got some um, ethnicity of your own and everything. So it might have been something that was a family issue or something that you were interested in from a family standpoint. But just tell us a little bit about yourself. And then I do have some questions about what's going on now. Like I know that um, definitely seems like uh, Vice President Kamala Harris went down to Guatemala and had a very hard line stance. And in my mind, I was thinking it was a little bit too hard line, but I don't know whether you agree with me or not, but definitely we'll find out or not. But I just wanted you could share a little bit about your own background. Yeah, well, Mark, thank you so much for having me. I'm so grateful and honored to be here with you. Um, so my background, first of all, um, you can see me. So I'm, I am a South Asian. My parents are from Bangladesh. I grew up in London. I was born and raised in London. So if you've tuned into my accent, um, I am a British American. I moved to America in 2005 after I got married to my husband. Uh, a U.S. citizen, and then I went through the immigration process uh, to become a U.S. citizen eventually. But I was a, a lawyer in the U.K., and when I moved to America, I had to uh, become a lawyer again by taking exams and what have you. And then I fell into immigration, uh, not by choice, but because I didn't have a lot of options at the time, or at least it felt so. But what was interesting is um, immigration was my calling and it kept following me until I said, OK, I'll just do this. And once I started practicing immigration law, I just realized I was meant to do this all my life. I love the practice of immigration law. I'm touching people's lives uh, very directly. It's either their livelihoods or their loved ones. And the area of law is very challenging and interesting. It's always keeping me on my toes. Uh, never a dull day, as they say. And, you know, every morning I wake up and I wonder what the day holds for me. And, you know, uh, the last four years went, uh, you know, was in were interesting. And 2021 continues to be interesting. And um, my clients are amazing. I am so grateful and honored to help each and every one of them. Um, and then I, I like to be part of the change that I want to see. So I help, uh, you know, work on immigration policy issues, uh, you know, in my non-spare time. And I love helping my community because Immigration is something that affects the community in a very direct way as well. And so my ex expertise and my community involvement, all of that comes together in really giving back to those who need the help. Yeah, definitely. And like I was saying earlier, I know that this has definitely been a very important issue. We've seen things going on, like I mentioned to you before, with the Dreamers. And I know that definitely my uh, dad and even his lady friend have been involved in trying to help some of those here in uh, North Carolina. And definitely we have seen even uh, some of the different uh, ways that the different immigrant communities aren't always treated the same. So I've even had people say that sometimes they feel that those that are European immigrants might be treated differently than, say, the Asian immigrants might also be treated differently than some from the African communities and all of that. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your thoughts on the ways that we treat our immigrants, because I've always thought, you know, the fairy tale version of what we hear is, you know, give us your poor, your, uh, and all of that is on the, um, Statue of Liberty that's over there off of New York, but I don't know that we always do what is the, said on that um, great iconic image and everything, but I was just wondering if you could share your thoughts about maybe the different ways we treat our immigrants and also your thoughts about how we're doing in Latin America. Because like I said, I know that uh, Vice President uh, Kamala is over there dealing with a lot of things and didn't have that hardline stance with Guatemala and basically saying, y'all stay over there, don't come over here. You know, so um, let's touch on that before I talk about immigration as a whole. Right. I think the problem that we're seeing at the border, um, you know, it's gone on for many years. It's not a new thing at all. But what is new is that we have leadership that's trying to get to the root of the problem 
rather than just stick to what they need to do now. So what I appreciate about this is that uh, if you can try to address the root cause, then we might have a sustainable solution. What we have seen through previous administrations that these issues come up and the, the focus is how do we just uh, have a system at the border. And in President Obama's years, there, were, there was controversy. Uh, he was an amazing president. You know, I, I'm so appreciative of all, for all the things he did in immigration. But he was also labeled the deporter in chief. Um, right. And then we had uh, the Trump administration and there was no humanity whatsoever. Mm -hmm. you take away children from their parents, babies as young as, you know, a few months, there's no humanity. And how can we see that in a 20th century, 21st century America? You know, I don't think any of us when we were younger would think that this or uh, younger, even four years ago, that we would think America would be treating people this way. So now we fast forward into the Biden-Harris administration and they have inherited a confluence of problems that is compounded by the COVID pandemic. But what I appreciate is that they're trying to go to the root problem to see that what can be the solution. Now, these problems are not small problems. These are very profound, deep-rooted problems. So I do not expect the solution to be quick either. There needs to be a lot of exploration and collaboration. So um, I'm not privy to any of those conversations. I wish I yeah. were. But from the little that we've seen, you know, the founder of Chobani, uh, the yogurt maker, they've already committed to, you know, helping those economies with jobs and manufacturing. And I, I, I mean, I don't know the details, but I, I do know that efforts have already begun to have some solutions. So I think what we need to do is give time. It took four years for the previous administration to really collapse our system. And when something is broken, it takes time to rebuild. But what this administration is showing is humane leadership in trying to rebuild something so it's stronger and build back better, as their, as their slogan was. So yeah. I think people need to have some patience and give some time because these problems didn't come overnight. And these problems were not created by this administration. They are yeah. taking initiative to ha help find solutions. So that's what I can say about the border. I haven't been there. You know, I don't, I, I don't practice uh, asylum as much as those people do. It's a, it's a yeah. heartbreaking situation no matter which way you look at it. But it doesn't help that we had a, an administration over the last four years really take away humanity and how they treat people. Now, coming back to the broader question of how we're treating immigrants, you know, over the years, uh, there have been laws that have been discriminatory. There's no right. question about it. You know, if you look at the early 1900s, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act. You right. know, we had quotas that, um, you know, really don't necessarily reflect what the reality is in the current day. And so immigration reform has been necessary for decades. And we've yeah. not had um, congressional support for immigration reform. So what we need truly is immigration reform. Now, when it comes to treatment of people, I think we go back to the last four years where we saw a Muslim ban Right. which this administration right. has reversed. <clears throat> right. We had um, right. the previous administration call uh, African countries, you know, a terrible name starting with S, you right. know, um, <clears throat> and, they, and they really did do everything visibly possible to, you know, really make sure that immigrants were treated badly or uh, and even depicted badly. Right. And words matter. In the, how you talk about immigrants really matter. And that is what resulted in shooting in El Paso because it became okay to, you know, denigrate immigrants. But what we've seen with this administration, again, that they are really looking at, you know, deeply rooted ways in how immigrants are portrayed and the word alien um you know is now trying it's been taken away so the uscis is trying to make sure language is used appropriately to make sure we we give the respect to human beings and so i do hope 
that we will start to see changes. Um, there's a lot of sort of <clears throat> rumbling about it's been four months since right. this administration came into office. Why are we not say, seeing changes quick enough? And what I will say to that is it took some time and it's still, I don't think the people have been confirmed that we do have um, leadership. Not only do we have a president and a vice president that care about the people, but they've also care about leaders that they put in each place. So for the Department of Homeland Security, we have an immigrant who is now right. leading with compassion. You know, it's not an easy job, but they're right. also finding great leaders to be put into USCIS and other positions. USCIS, the uh, agency, U United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, that agency um, has some great leadership that has been nominated. There have been, um, uh, there was a testimonial, the, the, the confirmation hearing. I don't know if those um, confirmations have actually happened yet, but once that leadership gets into place, I am certain that we will start to see improvements. But one of the things that is important for people to know is right now, because of the way COVID has affected the globe, yeah. all immigrants are being treated the same, in my opinion. And that is there are delays and there are processing delays, there are appointment delays, and everybody universally is affected the same. One of the things that's really important for people to understand is immigration is not just what you see at the border. Immigration is so much more than that. If you think about the phone that you use, the phone that's been operated in, in the hardware, the software, the network, there are high-skilled immigrants behind the scenes that are maintaining all of those that you don't know about. Those are immigrants that are being employed by American businesses. American businesses are part of immigration. You do not understand that from the way you hear it in the news. You know, immigration is also about families. You know, there are American citizens who have loved ones, whether they're spouses and parents and children in different countries, waiting to get green cards, waiting to come here on visas that are not able to do it. Immigration is so much more than that. The other thing I want people to understand is immigration is the economy. Immigration is something that should be used as a tool to really help boost the economy of America. You know, I wrote a book called The Startup Visa. I don't know if you can mm -hmm. see it. Can you see it? Yeah, there you go. I think my lighting yeah. is up. Um, I wrote this book because in 2015, when I wrote the book, it was a culmination of events that led to my saying, well, you know, I just got to tell people why we need immigrants, how immigrants are creating jobs. If you think about the skilled workers that are here, right. every, every skilled worker has a multiplier effect on jobs that are created. One person needs a CPA, a doctor, you know, um, all sorts of professional assistance and then they need services like a cleaner um you know um a laundry uh, um, a cleaner a, um, a gardener you you name it there are services that people need if you just think about your own life you know if somebody comes to the u.s they need that help so there is a circular uh, you know effect on the jobs that get created but if you think about the businesses that get opened here they need, they are creating Amer American jobs all the time. So not only are they individually contributing to the economy eh, with their own tax dollars, their own, you know, contribution to the, the payroll tax and IRS, they're also creating a circular event of other jobs that keep the, the economy going. So I want people to understand that immigration is so much more than what they see in the news. And if they want to educate themselves, you know, read a little bit more about the immigrants that came here before, you know, we were here or we were born, you know. Anybody that's in America, if you're not Native American, you have ancestors that came here as immigrants. And oh, yeah. if you, you know, it's if you think about 
any of the things that you use on a daily basis. Headphones that were, you know, created by Bose, the, the famous Bose headphones. He's an immigrant. Yeah. If you think about Disneyland, Walt Disney was a second generation immigrant. If you think about going to the stores and you go to Nordstrom, Nordstrom was an immigrant. If you yeah. think about the jeans you wear, Levi's jeans, he was an immigrant. If you think about Procter and Gamble, the toothpaste and all the other products you use, Procter and Gamble, they were immigrants. And I have in my book, I have uh, the second edition coming out in July okay. about why we need a visa for startup founders. But there is a chapter about history and mm -hmm. all of these names are in it to remind us that everything that we look at, you know, no matter how you look at immigrants are integrated, you know, integrated into all of that. So, you know, what is important to you? I'd love to know. Yeah, because one of the you things uh, I'm decided to interrupt you, one of the things I found interesting, and it's not an attitude that I have, but I sometimes find it fascinating that when people think about some of the jobs that they don't want to take and that they get mad and kind of the Immigrants are taking these jobs. A lot of times, these are jobs that, if you offer them those opportunities, they're the first ones that don't want the jobs because a lot of these jobs are, they're not easy jobs. They're like construction. They're jobs that have to do with a number of other things as well. So they're not easy jobs to do. And a lot of times, they're jobs that, you know, pay some pretty good wages, but they also are very much hard labor, whether it's the migrant farmer or whether it's the construction worker or whether it's the people doing the highways and all of that. I'm so glad you brought that up because I talk to business owners regularly who cannot find people to take these jobs, whether it is a construction company or whether it's a nursing home, you know, a slaughterhouse, you know, they cannot find these people. So this rhetoric of they're taking our jobs, what jobs are they taking away? Right. When it comes to low skilled nothing is low skilled about them you know i speak to people on a very regular basis just to some examples um a construction business owner called me and said i i can't find people who know the right way of the saw so i'm constantly worried about are they going to chop their arms off you know mm -hmm. are they going to have an accident if they come if i can get them to take the job in the first place yeah. and they take the job just enough time to then leave the job and then maybe claim unemployment. Um, I, when I speak to these um, home care business owners, they need people who have nursing uh, experience because they're taking care of hospice people, people who cannot take care of themselves. Nobody wants to, you know, clean people, you know, who are unable to clean themselves.
Well, we were having some interesting technical things going on with that pre-recorded show and everything, but definitely that gives you a little taste of the immigration discussion. And speaking to folks from around the world and everything, before we jump over to Mullins, I was going to bring in my good buddy, D, because that's all he was watching, a little bit of the expo and the conversations around that. And definitely he's been over there in Ireland. So I'll bring him in before I jump on over to my four o'clock show. But I just wanted to give folks a taste of what the immigration conversation was all about. And I may bring up more of that interview on another edition of the international broadcast radio show. But we've had some great conversations and I just wanted folks to get a taste of what uh, Miss Watson was all about. But I do have uh, D Riley coming in at us all the way from Ireland. So how are you doing today? Uh, hi, hi, Mike. How are you? It's good. I'm doing it's good. good to talk to you. Yeah. yeah, it's been a while. It has been a while. How's everything going there in Ireland? You doing all right? Uh, well, first of all, you know, just to correct it, I'm in Scotland. Scotland, Scotland, right. And I'm right, you know, because, well, you know, it's, it's fine, you know, in, in nowhere. The COVID restrictions are now relaxed. Everything is still quite subdued and quite quiet, but it's fine. So you, it's said they have, you said they have lifted some of the restrictions there in Scotland, or they're still no, no, pretty oh heavy? Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. They've, they've lifted most of them. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, it's good. It's good. Well, that's so good. I've got normality. Well, normality is yeah. always a good thing and everything, and you're always yeah, keeping yeah. busy. I know you popped in with Brian and everything, but you haven't seen you in a while, but I was glad to see that you were watching some of the things that were going on. I saw one of the questions you asked yesterday, which is about the uh, need for that conference, and that's because of the disparity that exists sometimes between the African-American population and the European population, but that's not to say that there weren't people on there that had disabilities and other things. So I think there were some folks that would agree that we need to have various uh, conversations going on. And by the way, Tim was just saying hello to both of us. <laughs> Hi, Tim. How are you doing? Well, well it's really not, I can't get, I can't help get worked up a wee bit because, you know, for example, your previous guest going on about, going on about migration and uh, right. You know, I get a little bit cross sometimes, particularly here in Scotland, because the Scottish government say we we need highly skilled migrants, but right. but people like me, highly skilled and uh, native people, can't get jobs. Wow. And I, I think, well, well, if we're so desperate for skilled people, why can't? You know why won't they employ me? And right. and 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 I made them very angry. Uh, yeah, That's good. Yeah, I understood. Like I said, but and sometimes the opposite thing happens here. Sometimes because sometimes folks won't even take the jobs that uh because they are very hard jobs, and some of those jobs the folks here won't take even when they're offered the jobs because some of our migrants are in farm in situations and construction and other things. And I've even had some friends that have told me that if they were given that job, they would not take it just because they find it too hard and all of that. So I can definitely understand your attitude. And when I was talking to a friend about that, because they were saying that even here, sometimes folks from the Asian countries get those bigger paying jobs and they're coming from Asia, but they've also got degrees from here and they would like to get the job as well. So it's probably yeah, a that's right. sword. You know, I find, you know, I find it just in, 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 in and because because we've got to say says here where somebody from overseas can get a job a lot easier than I can just just for the very fact that they're from overseas and everything. Oh, great immigrants, immigrants, you know, can go and I think it's gone way. Far, way far the other way, you know. Gotcha. So, so, you know, I'm not opposed to immigration, but we need to say stop. Right. It's just, it's just getting ridiculous. I hear you. By the way, uh, Tim said they should hire you. He said that they should hire you. Well, well nobody hires me. That's the trouble, you know. You know, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no obligation on employers to employ disabled people, so why would they? I understood. You know, so, yeah. Yep, I definitely understand that, but Tim was saying that they need to hire you. 
I think they need to hire you too. So like I said, anybody looking for employment, I think that D Riley is a great person and y'all need to go ahead and give him a, a job if that's what he wants. So I would agree with them, with Tim, that they need to hire and everything. But you know, Tim was having a real deep conversation with Nancy yesterday. They were talking about some of the things that he's going through and everything in terms of his health. So we're having a real deep conversation on um, connected, uh, the connected show that she does. So it was great hearing some of that conversation. And I don't even know, like I was saying on the thing, that Tim knows how great a person he is. And I know that both you, me, Nancy, and others keep trying to tell him that he's an amazing producer and an amazing gentleman, but he doesn't always listen and always want to accept that praise from others. So Tim, out there, you know you're an amazing producer. If you want to jump out here and or jump on and chastise me for telling the folks that, uh, you'll have to jump on the four o'clock link because I got to go to my four o'clock show later. But you can uh, you can jump on that. I said that link as well. But definitely, uh, I know that you are amazing, and that they need to hire you for more contracts as well. As a matter of fact, I think Tim's got some speaking engagements coming up. So Tim's amazing, but you're doing great as well. And by the way, Tim was saying I'm great for giving him praise. So we're all great. <laughs> So what are you doing today over there in Scotland? And what time is it there in Scotland? I always get my uh, time zones mixed up. As as uh, 9 p.m. Okay. So it's you're about two or three hours away from bedtime. Uh, well, uh, I think I'm more like half an hour away from bedtime. Oh, half an hour away from bedtime. <laughs> so you already had dinner, and what was for dinner? Uh, salad. Check. Huh? I was fine, some chicken and some salad. I was fine, and uh, but there's not there's not much happening here. But empty, empty life. No, not you know, No, you don't have an empty life. You got a great life, and it's yeah. gonna be even better. You're gonna make it better. You're gonna continue doing the great things you're doing in media, and you're gonna continue doing other great things as well. You know, you, I've got powerful words for you that 2021 is going to be an amazing year for you and 2022 you're just going to soar i've already claimed that for you you're going to soar in 2022 okay yep i'm already claiming it for you and if that if that's that job you want i think that the job is going to come as well but i actually think that you're going to create your own like businesses that are going to take off whether that's in the media or whether that's your other businesses as well so I already think that things are going to be much better than they are. We've had a rough year and a half. I know I've had a rough year and a half as yeah. well, but I'm already claiming that it's going to be better for the rest of the year and for 2022. But both you, me, Tim, Nancy, Brian, and the whole crew. So I'm thinking it's going to be a better year. So um, let's just go ahead awesome. and claim it. Yeah, sounds good. Cool. Well, I'm here to wrap up this show. I do have to go over to Mullins and everything. You know, one of the things I always do on all my shows is I get my guests to give their words of encouragement their words of positivity for the listening audience around the globe. You're coming at us from Scotland, so I'm sure the folks that are in the United States and other places would love to hear your words of positivity and encouragement. Oh, mine is just to live in the moment, to stay present in the moment, and uh, yeah, and be grateful for everything we've got in the West. We're yep. very privileged. That's very true. So I want to thank you for jumping on. I want to thank Tim for making some comments. I had another commenter as well. So give it a wrap up the show with our lovely little uh, audio robot that both ends and begins the show. So I'm actually going to go back to our other uh, platform and everything, which is that one. And then we'll have the little robot playing in the background as well. So uh, by the way, Tim was giving a big shout out to Scotland. So Tim said shout out to Scotland and all of that. So hey I've got Tim, to... love you. Yes, he is mm-hmm. definitely and uh definitely he had another comment too. Let's see what else Tim said. I think Tim was saying that we are definitely grateful. So he's agreeing to your grateful comment. Yes, he said grateful we're all here. So that is definitely something very positive in that regards. We're all here and we're all going to try to continue to do these amazing things and all of that. So I'm going to let you watch a little bit of the robot as we head on out of here. And this is the robot about the show. And I've got to jump on to Mullins, but I'm glad you were able to jump on. Hey, uh, thanks for having me, Mark. No it's problem. Nice to talk to you. Sorry, it's always good to talk to you. Take care. See what Tim said before we get ready to get on out of here. And that's right. Tim said he's sending you love. So he's sending you love as well. (laughs) Cool. Let's get on out of here. There we go.